Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. Time's almost up for Cecil. See how Cecil Solver can help. Before we begin, we are in presentation mode, which means you can hear us, but we cannot hear you. If you have any questions, please click on the question icon on your screen, and we will answer all questions towards the end of the webinar. Uh, you will also receive an email with the slides from the webinar, most likely tomorrow sometime, along with the link of the recording for our YouTube channel, where we also post all of our, our webinars. Uh, we're, uh, we have a couple more minutes. Uh, we're going to take a few more minutes uh, of pause time to let to give a little bit more time for everybody else to log in. Uh, so give it about another minute or two, and we will be back. Hello, everybody. My name is David Surrey, and I have been working with QuickRate for the last 17 years. Actually, this month makes it 17 years. We also have Steve Huntington on the line. He is our director of Quick Analytics with over 20 years of experience working with financial institutions. And he is our CECL expert who created our CECL solver tool, which is what he's going to demonstrate today. So. Let's talk about Cecil. One of the comments we hear in our demos is, what's wrong with the current incurred loss model? Why the change? So this all goes back to the last crisis. And in FASB's opinion, they felt that the incurred loss model did a disservice to financial institutions by allowing them to not acknowledge losses until they were probable. This approach used to recognize impairment losses on financial assets and has long been identified as a major weakness, resulting in delayed recognition of those losses. So at this point, FASB had a couple of options, either fix the methodology or do nothing, knowing if you do nothing and the problem reoccurs, then you leave yourself exposed to hearing, well, why didn't you do anything to fix it? Clearly, FASB decided that that was not going to be their solution, so they decided to fix it. And Cecil was that fix. This means learning a new way to calculate your reserve. At the end of the day, we are just calculating a reserve. We like to say we're playing the same game, just with a new set of rules. We are still going to focus on reserves. We're just going to go about it in a slightly different manner. So let's talk about some of those changes. First, there is no one mandatory method for calculating your reserve under CSUN. NCUA has mentioned several different methodologies like the WARM method, but the choice is completely up to you. You choose your path and you will have to defend this to your examiner and absolutely understand 
where your final reserve number is coming from. And of course, document this appropriately. This will be the case for any tool or partner that you choose. NCUA has, has also stated that your chosen reserve methodology should match the complexity of your portfolio. For most tr traditional credit units under a few billion in asset size, a call report driven analysis using the WARM methodology will be perfectly acceptable. You do not need to engage in highly and overly complex modeling or loan level analysis. <clears throat> Excuse me. When it comes to implementing CECL, there are some practical considerations. <clears throat> Excuse me. First, how much data have you collected? Do you have detailed loan level data going back at least five years? To do a more complex loan level analysis, you'll need to have this data collected and reconciled before you can even start your first actual reserve calculation, a process that can take a couple of years. For other warm options, what is the actual cost? Is it Excel-based? How much actual work do you think you'll have to allocate to, to calculate your reserve? Free options might not have any cost attached to them, but they tend to be expensive when it comes to your time. How about data from outside of your credit union? Uh, what have the loss trends been in your state? How do, how do your losses compare? Having good internal data is important, but having comparable data, peer data, will be very helpful, especially in areas where you have little to no losses. Peer data can help to establish reasonable and supportable CECL reserves and further support your reserve figure. In the end, we feel that CECL Solver hits that target perfectly, that hits that target of uh, hits that target balance of simplicity and automation while still giving you the ability to add complexity where needed. In the very beginning, we saw the original guidance for CECL. The guidance was for more complex, massive, multi-billion dollar institutions. And we knew that wouldn't work for most of our credit unions and most of the credit unions across the country. We set out to create a CECL tool that was easy to use, collected the relevant data for you, and to create a CECL tool that was just easy to understand and easy to follow. We also wanted to create a CECL solution that was quick to implement and easy to maintain from month to month or quarter to quarter. We feel we've done exactly this with, with our CECL solver tool, which brings us to the live demo. This Thank is where I will hand it over to Steve. Thank you, David. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Uh, give us just a second so he can unshare his screen and I can uh, pull up my browser here so that we can um, go ahead and give you a demo of the tool. All right, share my screen now. Let me know when that pops up for you, David. Looks good. Excellent. Um, so what you see here is the, the summary page and exactly pretty much what the CISL tool would look like the first time that you ever log in for your credit union. Obviously, we're using a, a sample credit union today. I believe the guinea pig that I chose was a, a, uh, a larger size credit union, maybe about $2 billion in assets located in the Midwest. Um, one of the things that you will notice is that when you first log in, all of your historical data and that of your peers is already preloaded into the system at, from, from the first second that you, you pull up the page. The reason we're able to do this is we start our initial segmentation around the data that we can get from your Form 5300 call reports um, that you, everyone's got to file every quarter. We've been gathering those for years and aggregating them. And so when you first log in, you'll see your entire historical experience by call report segment, balance changes, charge offs, recoveries, past dues, all that information is already preloaded into the system and gets updated every single quarter as soon as everybody files their call reports. 
So it is a huge kind of ramp. The ramping up to get ready to use our tool is a process that takes almost no time whatsoever. Um, in addition to having your historical data preloaded into the system, we have that of all of your peers. So we're collecting all the call reports across the country each quarter so that when you want to compare your historical experience, let's say you haven't had any losses in your mortgage portfolio over the last six or seven years, but you're trying to justify a CECL reserve that's much more than zero. Your historical experience alone is not going to give you the justification, the, the, you know, the narrative that you need to explain why you have a large qualitative factor adjustment. The peer data is where that will come in extremely handy because the entire analysis that I'm about to go through with you, we do that same entire analysis behind the scenes simultaneously for every single other credit union in your peer group and then show the data in the, in the peer tab, which we'll get to in just a couple minutes. Now, um, David mentioned that there's a bunch of different methodologies available for, for CECL. The more straightforward methodologies are what they refer to as a warm method or warm-like method, warm being uh, standing for weighted average remaining maturity. And our tool is based upon a weighted average remaining maturity methodology as well. Um, the first step in CECL, whether you're doing a warm method or any method, honestly, is to get a handle on the remaining lives of the loans you have currently, right? Since CECL is all about estimating losses over the remaining lives of the assets, we have to get a feel for what that is for each of our loan pools. Now that's something that is not available in the public arena, right? Nowhere on your call reports or anywhere else does it ask you to do a way to, a remaining maturity calculation for your, for your segments of your loan portfolio. That's something that has to be done at the loan level. And it's something we don't have available to us, at least not publicly speaking. So that's the first step and something that we work with our customers to do proper form calculations to input into the tool and everything is driven off of those calculations. Now, the easiest way to do form calculations is if your core provider or your ALM provider happens to have a report that you can request that does a remaining maturity calculation. That happens every once in a while. It's great if that's the case, but we found a lot of our customers don't really have that option or their, their other providers cannot provide that for them. And so they're stuck calculating it themselves internally. If that's the case, we have a template that you can follow that shows you exactly what information you would need and how you would calculate a uh, weighted average remaining maturity. That's right here in our warm estimator tool. So I'm going to open this up for just a second so everyone can get a feel for how that Excel-based tool works. Just keeping in mind that what I, what I show you here now on the Excel-based form estimator tool, if you don't have the time, energy, or inclination to go through that process internally at the credit union, we you, you can offload that to us as well. You can send us your low-level data, and we will do the warm calculations for you and provide you this uh, a finalized version of the spreadsheet that I'm about to, to demo for a couple seconds. So it's really up to you whether you want us to handle it or whether that's something that you think you can do internal. Let me open it up. I never know what screen Excel's gonna open in, so give me a second. Ready screen all. Ah, here we go. Um, excuse me. So the warm estimator tool, there's a summary. Again, it's organized by, by call report segment, just like our tool is here, are all the current segments on the call report. There's information about prepayment assumptions, different methodologies for calculating warms, depending upon how conservative or aggressive you want to be in the warm calculation and NCUA guidance on warm or on default values uh, that can be used in place of um, doing your own internal calculations. Uh, this is where the NCUA data comes from. Uh, the NCUA was just back in late October of last year where uh, they had sort of decided that they needed to provide more assistance for most credit unions in, from a CECL perspective. And the best way that they could do that would, was to analyze information, analyze loan level uh, data from smaller credit unions under 100 million or so around the country and give some good industry guidance for things like prepayment assumptions and warm calculations. So we were able to utilize something that they'll be updating, by the way, on a quarterly basis. 
going forward. And all that information is here in this, in this spreadsheet. Um, but the way we organize it, again, each tab is a separate segment of your portfolio. And the information that you need are balance and maturity date information. Let's say we're looking at new vehicle loans. Um, the only loan level information we really need is balance and maturity date. From that information, we can calculate a weighted average remaining maturity. We can overlay a prepayment estimate to get that weighted average down some. And then if you wanted to take the next step and be a little bit more aggressive in your warm calculations, which is totally acceptable and appropriate, uh, especially given the more recent um, NCUA guidance, is to take into account amortization as well. Amortization can be taken into account at the at, uh, with a universal kind of straight line assumption. Or if you really want to dig into the details at a low level, you could plug in different amortization and balloon type assumptions at the uh, for each individual loan and get a uh, a complete amortization uh, worksheet, um, loan level amortization worksheet that would then calculate a weighted average remaining maturity. So you have different options in calculating your warm. It is subjective, of course, for you to decide which which methodology you think is most uh, gives a remaining maturity that you think most accurately reflects your current portfolio. Um, but we provide all the options. We show you how to do the math and how to do the calculations. And we can, we can get all your loan level data into a spreadsheet like this for you if you need the additional assistance. But long story short, as much or as little help as you need in the warm calculations, we can certainly provide. Once we've got that down, that's the first big step. That's the only step where we have to really dig into the loan level data um, from then on, we take those warm calculations by call report segment, and that drives the rest of the process. What I mean by that is, uh, let's pick a guinea pig for today and say, uh, let's go with used vehicle loans. Let's say that we calculated a warm for our used vehicle portfolio, and it was 2.5 years. If I plug in 2.5 years here, it takes just a couple seconds. And in that couple seconds, everything just recalculated on the fly across the board for used vehicle loans as it pertains to season. That is one thing you'll notice about our tool, which is, which is hugely efficient, is that the entire tool is built in the cloud, meaning that anytime you change any input or any assumption anywhere in the tool, the entire tool recalculates from scratch. And so you can immediately see the impact of a change in warm, a change in the look back period, a change in your qualitative factor adjustment, or just a change in your balance. You can see instantaneously in real time what impact that's going to have on your, your necessary reserve for that segment and for the entire portfolio. And that kind of instant feedback, visual instant feedback, saves you a huge amount of time when you're trying to build different scenarios, right? Well, I've seen lots of tools out there and other models where you have to plug in hundreds of inputs and assumptions. And until you finish all of them, you have the report generated and then downloaded or printed off or whatever. Uh, at, by that point, when you see a vastly different bottom line, you have no idea how you got there, right? You can't, it's very difficult to reverse engineer which change that I made had this big impact. You know, when I changed, when my balances went up, what, did that have a huge impact on my reserve and why? you know, when I change the Q factor adjustment or a look back period. So with our tool, none of that is a concern. And I think that really saves you time because it tells you where you need to spend your time and energy. We don't want you wasting any more time on, on, on reserve accounting than is absolutely necessary. And if you spend a huge amount of time sharpening the, the point on one specific assumption, only to find out that no matter what you use there, it didn't really make a hill of beans a difference, right? It didn't move the needle for your reserve calculation then that was not time well spent. And so the way we've designed the tool, you'll get a feel very quickly when you start using it for, you know, which is something so I really need to be very precise and careful about and which ones can I, you know, do a quick calculation because it's not going to make much of a difference. Anyway, back to the task. Uh, once we've calculated the form, let's say two and a half years, we know that our the average remaining life of our used vehicle loans is two and a half years. What Cecil is really demanding of us is that we project two and a half years worth of losses going forward in aggregate, right? Losses over the remaining lives of the assets. So if we're going to project two and a half years worth of future losses on used vehicle loans, 
Well, the starting point for that is to see what history would suggest, right? We're going to go back into time um, and we are, uh, we're going to take a symmetrical view of a look back period, at least by default, meaning to project two and a half years, let's look at a two and a half year period in, in the past and see what our experience was, right? How have our balances changed over that last two and a half years? How many charge offs have we aggregated? What direction is that charge off trend headed in? And we take all that historical information to calculate the first big piece of the puzzle for CISO. And that is, what is our credit union's historical lifetime loan cost? And for this particular institution, it is 44 basis points. Now, there's a lot of data that goes into that 44 basis points, right? But because of the way we designed the tool and the methodology we're using, there is no black box here. You have all the data within this tool at your fingertips to go completely from cradle to grave in auditing that calculation, directly from what you publicly file on your call reports each quarter, all the way through to what that lifetime historical loss rate is. Now, a lot of that detail is right here in the historical analysis tab. Now, this tab is, is organized into annual columns because we didn't want you, know, you to have to scroll through 60 quarters worth of data that wouldn't be very convenient on a, on a website. And so we look at annual uh, data here so we can see the loss trends, but we also have a data export where if you wanted to pull every single quarterly historical value going all the way back to the, the dinosaurs in order to fully audit every number, you could, you could do so with the, data, with the data dump export. However, for the interactive tool here, what we want to accomplish on the historical analysis page is getting a visual feel for how our portfolio has trended size-wise and performance-wise over various look-back periods, depending upon how long the average remaining life of those loans are. I'm going to want to go back further in time for a, a, a mortgage portfolio that has an average life of six or seven years in order to get a feel for how that performs over a lifetime. Then I need to go back in time if I'm looking at, you know, payday loans or construction loans where, you know, over the course of three years, they're going to turn over multiple times. We don't need to go back seven years to get a feel for how they perform over an average lifetime. So that's why we match and mirror the look back periods to the warms. And you get a visual representation of that here. The blue shaded area is the look back period for each segment of the portfolio. It's in this sample, it's obviously longer for things like mortgage loans and student loans and shorter for vehicle loans and, and, and other types of loans. But sticking with our guinea pig, they use vehicle loans. We see that we've highlighted and we're looking at the last two and a half years. We see how balances have change over that two and a half year period. Uh, we see how charge offs have accumulated over that historical period. We see updated segmentation values as well. The reason why we have to have two different uh, segmentation data in, in two entirely separate sub, sub parts of, the, uh, of this page is because of all the changes that the MCUA made to the call reports last year. If you remember at March 31st of last year, the MCUA uh, decided that they should completely revamp all the asset quality information and uh, segmentation on the call reports. And of course, that was a significant challenge since we were in a period where everyone was transitioning to CECL and being required to find out more information about long-term loss experience trends at that time when they're changing all the buckets on the call reports. But we worked our way through that. And what we have here is sort of combined segmentation long-term historical loss trends. So we see for used vehicle loans, the, the types of losses that they've had for the last few years and over the last two and a half years total, the lifetime loss rate aggregate is 44 basis points. So that's what's shown there. And if I head back to the summary, there's the 44 basis points we were just talking about. So that's the first half of Cecil, right? We haven't gone outside our yet. We haven't considered environmental factors. We haven't um, considered how things might be different in the future. All we've done is analyze if the future were exactly like the past in our institution, this is what we could expect from, in law, from losses for the remaining lives of these assets, and this is what the reserve should be. Of course, that's the second half is the subjective, right? That was a relatively objective evaluation of historical experience, subjectivity being, of course, in how you calculate a warm. But the second half of CISO is 100% subjective. 
It is all those qualitative factor adjustments, all the reasons you have to believe that current and future conditions may be a little bit different from the historical experience that we just calculated. So how do we do that? That's where we go to the key factors page. This is our home base for all that subjectivity. All those adjustments, each one being its own column here, its own key factor, that represent the reasons why we think things might be different in the future. Now, you don't need to use, we, we kind of preloaded pre this page with all of the suggested qualitative factors that have been in part of our guidance forever. This part of the process here, by the way, is not completely new. It's, it doesn't have to be very different at all from what you've always been doing. Qualitative factors are not a new concept. In the interagency guidance for loan loss reserve accounting that we got over 20 years ago, they suggested certain, certain factors that should at least be considered, right? Things like changes in lending policies and procedures and portfolio mix, changes in management and staff, uh, changes in credit concentrations. So you'll notice we have all of those suggested possible Q factor adjustments up here on top. Now, if any of them don't pertain, you certainly don't are not expected to make an adjustment for each Q factor for each segment of your portfolio. That would be totally inappropriate and massive overkill. There may be some Q factors that you don't have any adjustments for at all. They're just not not appropriate for your institution. In that case, you, let's say, you know, your loan review system has been the same for 15 years and you don't see any reasons why you'd be making an adjustment to your historical experience for that. Well, get rid of it. I just got rid of it. You can remove any of these columns that you want. You can add new custom columns. Let's say that you, you know, you, uh, you had a merger three, three or four years ago. You acquired another smaller credit union and you, they had some, you know, problem loans on the books that you had to deal with. And that's mostly up now, but there are still some loans that are that are you know now part of your books that have some extra risk because of that, and you want that to be captured somewhere within this analysis. You could just say merger adjustments and make your own qualitative factor adjustment right there and make an adjustment here as a result of it. Now, as you make all these adjustments on the Q factors page, as important, if not probably more important than what size adjustment you make is how you justify it, right? This is points for paper big time. So that's why we made an administrative tool here where you can click on this and as you're making your adjustments, you make all your notes as to why you made those adjustments at that point in time for that particular segment of the portfolio. As soon as you make these notes, they get attached to that segment throughout the analysis, whenever you save it, whenever you export it, so that when you're, you know, in the audit, in the exam, and they're, and they're going through this, you have a clear narrative that you've built around it. And then next quarter, when you're coming to update it, um, you can look at these notes and see exactly what you were thinking when you looked at it last time and why you made the adjustments that you did. So that's a good administrative tool. You also notice here that we have a couple summary charts over here. This is a great visual summary kind of going on with Cecil. Um, you can change that by clicking on any different segment of the portfolio and seeing what that trend looks like. But just looking at the mortgage portfolio here, the first liens, you can see what your credit union's loss history trend is. That's the blue bars. You can see your peer group's trend. That's the green lines. Um, you can see the gray shaded. It's just the look back period, right, that we're using to start estimating CECL. And then the orange line is a total CECL estimate based on all the factors and all the assumptions that we put into it. If you change an assumption or anything else, you'll see this update on the fly. So if I were to, uh, come into the mortgage portfolio here and add another, let's say, 25 basis point Q factor adjustment. There, it just bumped up the CECL estimate by exactly 25 basis points and it visually updated there. And whenever you make any changes anywhere throughout the tool, it links and syncs with the other pages. So you see, I just made an adjustment there. And my net, my, now my net Q factor adjustment is 45 basis points. I head back to the summary here and find mortgage loans. There's that 45 basis points that I just modified and adjusted there. You don't need to go worry about going back and forth to different pages and making sure you type in the same information. Everything is linked and connected and syncs together. Um, we also have, uh, we have a bunch of economic trends that you can overlay over your loss experience trend and your peers to, to check for any you know, significant correlations that you think might impact your qualitative factor adjustments. 
once you're done with that, again, the net Q factor adjustment, the sum of all these positives and negatives is what gets transferred to the summary, the final calculation. Um, one way we can really help, you know, one Q factor that we can really provide a lot of help in is the peer experience. And peer experience, as I think I alluded to earlier, is so important, especially when you have a segment that you just don't have much loss experience or you have no loss experience within any reasonable look back period. If you've got 30 per 40% of your loans in mortgages, and you've had no losses over the last eight years, does that mean you're allowed to have no CECL reserve, no ACL for your mortgage portfolio, zero going forward? Of course not. There's no way we'd get away with that, right? So we've got to justify having some Q factor adjustment for a portfolio where we have zero loan losses over any reasonable period. We can't get, we can't justify whatever that adjustment's going to be simply by looking at our own internal data because it's nothing but zeros. So we've got to look outside of, not outside the box, outside of our four walls. We've got to look to the environment around us for contextual clues as to what might be in a, an appropriate adjustment for a zero loss history segment, right? The best way to do that is to find the most comparable apples to apples loss data for similar credit unions that you can find, right? Aggregate all that if you have that data and then use that to compare your historical rate to to say, this is a reason why we made a 10 basis point adjustment because we've had zero, but our peers have had 30 basis point net, adjust, net losses over the last four years. And so we're gonna move in the direction of our peers and make a 10 or 15 basis point Q factor adjustment, right? That's how it would work sort of in practice. Now, how do we get that peer data? Well, we do it by doing this entire historical analysis that we do on your credit union, all this data, we're doing it for every single other credit union in your peer group simultaneously in the background, crunching millions of those call report numbers in order to get this. What this represents are historical loss rates by loan segment, the same segmentation as we're using for you guys, so apples to apples, and overlaying your look back periods. What happens when we do that is we can, in effect, calculate historical lifetime loss rates for your peer group on average, right? That we can then compare perfectly comparably to your historical lifetime loss rate over the same look back period in the same segment of the portfolio. And that gives you a perfectly comparable number to say, uh, to then turn into some sort of a qualitative factor adjustment. Recognizing that even though, you know, your loss experience has been negligible, there is risk out in the marketplace. And I've been able to quantify it by looking at all the, all the mortgage loans amongst, you know, 100 to $500 million credit unions in my state. I looked at all of them and we averaged out their loss experience over the same period and found that they averaged 50 basis points. We think we'll continue outperforming them. So we're gonna split the difference, right? That's kind of how the process would work, but it gives you a great justification and narrative for those Q factors where otherwise it'd be very difficult to justify. Heading back to the summary, once we've gone through that whole process, we've really reached a uh, uh, expected future loss rate. And that is expected future loss rate is simply our historical loss experience, plus or minus the sum total of all of our changes to it, right? All of our Q factors is equal to what we expect moving forward on a percentage basis. Once we have that, we have to apply it to the current loan portfolio balance in order to calculate a required an ACL, right? And so by default, this value here, these are your most recent quarter end loan balances that are preloaded into the system. Every time you file a new call report and start a new scenario, the new quarter's data will be up here, but that does not limit how often you run the tool or when you run it as of. Uh, just because we only have access publicly to your quarterly call reports does not mean you can't come in here in, on February 1st and plug in your January 31st GL and say, hey, I want the calculation to be as of the end of January. All you do is come in here and override these quarter end balances with your, say, January 31st balances, and then make a note that you're saying, hey, you know, I did my, my data is as of 131, right? And you over, you just type in the date that you're manually overriding. Or if you want, if you want to just pick a historical quarter, this is all call report data. So we have this. So let's say you want to roll back the clock and look at it, look at it as of 930 of last year. Do that. And all those data points, all those current values just got updated to be as of September 3rd. 
Once we have those balances, we have to see if there's anything we need to do to adjust. Them. This is a brand new column that we just added um, recently to the tool. So for any of you who are familiar with the tool, this will be new. Um, instead of asking you to manually subtract any balances that, that are outside the scope of C. So let's say you've got some government guarantees in your SBA portfolio. Uh, let's say you've still got some PPP or COVID loans on the books, or you have some fully share secured loans on the books. These are loans that have no risk of loss. So we shouldn't be applying a future loss rate to those balances. So we want to just back them out, right? Back them out of the entire calculation. Um, the old way to do that would be to simply, well, subtract them from this balance here and then make a note that we've done that. The new way, as of I think just last week or so, we added another, we were able to cram another column onto the page here. And you can explicitly say what adjustments or exclusions you're making to your stated call report balances. And then you can make a note and say, hey, we netted out 1 million in fully share secured loans from our all other unsecured bucket. So that's how that would be managed. Uh, the last thing we need to think about before we do our final calculation is, do we have any loans that need to be uh, assessed on an individual basis, right? Do we have any loans that are problematic enough that we need to call them from the herd and do a one-off calculation of expected loss for them? Now, we've got a spot for that in the tool. There's a tab for individually assessed loans. You'd go through here. You'd plug in that information. You can do it at the loan level, or you can aggregate all, all, the, all the individually assessed loans from a call report segment if you want and just do one line. It's up to you. Um, plug that information in, and then that transfers right to the summary. Let's say we had a $350,000 mortgage loan that we individually assessed. Well, we're not going to do a collective calculation on that. Uh, we're going to do an individual. So we back that 350 out, and we get the net balance, the 99.5%. Uh, once we have our kind of our final collectively uh, assessed loan population here, we apply our expected future lifetime loss rate to it that we calculated, and we get an ACL calculation. We add those up for the whole portfolio. We get a total ACL required for the collective pool. Then we add back the, uh, the losses for the um, individually assessed loan that we have done on the other tab, add those two together, and you get the total calculated ACL for the loan portfolio. Um, in this case, say 12 million bucks, uh, which is one, just over 1% 1 of their portfolio. We compare it to their current reserve of let's say 9 million and means that they've got a bit of a shortfall. Maybe they had some losses, maybe they're just doing their day one adjustment, what have you. And so it shows what surplus or shortfall you have compared to your current reserve, um, showing what you need right there. And that's pretty much the steps of how to use the tool. Uh, I've gone through this, I've gone through the peer data and the Q factors, the individually assessed loans, health and maturity securities. Don't wanna spend much time had we, uh, we did a webinar last Friday, a, a coffee talk. I don't know if any of you have been on our coffee talks. They're a, a kind of a free flowing um, Q&A type session with a lot of our users. And we have hundreds of credit unions that log into it every month and, and ask questions, which is great. If you haven't been to one, I, I strongly suggest it. Uh, our next one is, a, is sometime in March. And David will tell you when at the end of the, the uh, webinar in a few minutes here. Um, but I think 97% of uh, the credit unions that we talk to are not making any significant adjustment for held maturity securities for CISO purposes. And that would happen if you have a, have a held maturity portfolio, and B, if you have securities in there that are not government guaranteed, that have real risk of credit loss, not interest rate risk, but credit loss risk. Uh, um, and if you did, you can certainly plug that information in here and, uh, and it's something you can keep track of over time. Once we've made any of those adjustments here, the last thing that you'll notice is that there is a separate tab for unfunded commitments. So this is something that you guys, credit unions, haven't really been asked to evaluate in the past. It's not currently a line item on your call report. But it will be a line item on your call report starting March 31st. There'll be a new line item. It'll be in the liability section, and it'll ask you to estimate a potential or calculate and establish a, an allowance for your off balance sheet credit exposures. Those are those unfunded commitments or unused lines, whatever you want to refer them as uh, to. Um, and they ask you under a Cecil standard you need to estimate any potential future losses you may have from these loans that don't exist yet, right? So it's all a little bit hypothetical in nature, but we wanted to provide a, a, 
a, a, um, a module here to help you with that process. It's not a big piece of the puzzle for most credit unions at all, but it is something that you probably can't completely ignore. Um, so we can get some data from the call reports on your current total unfunded commitments uh, with a little bit of segmentation. And then we'll help you figure out what of those unfunded commitments are what they call unconditionally cancelable, which is an important term because any that are, you can back out and you don't have to worry about from a CECL perspective, whatever's left over, that's the amount that we have to at least estimate some sort of potential future losses. We do that by taking a guess at what the likelihood of those un unused lines are to be funded. And then for how long you have that responsibility, that, um, that commitment to, to fund, and then uh, what kind of losses might you see on those loans if they were to be funded in the future. So it's all, again, a little hypothetical here, but those are the steps you need to go through. We give you some good default values to go on. We have a lot of good footnotes here. If you're confused about how this system works, look at the footnotes. There's good explanations for why we have the defaults that we do, but everything is of course completely customizable and modifiable if that's something you wanna dig into and it will help you with the calculation there. Finally, you'll notice there's a newer, newish tab here on the right called File Upload. This is just an administrative tool. If you have any other ancillary documents that you'd like to attach or keep organized with your you know, allowance calculations, whether it's a new policy statement, whether it's some loan level data for a warm calculation or some additional narrative that you have around Q factor or some economic data, whatever it is, uh, if you want to keep it organized here within the tool, you can upload files and attach them to, uh, to the credit union or attach them to individual specific scenarios if you'd like to and just keep them available at your fingertips here. Um, once you have built a scenario exactly how you want it, you want to make sure you save it as a new scenario, give it a name, give it a date, and then save it. Once you've saved the scenario, everything we've just gone through today on here is securely saved on the cloud. You can come back and access it anytime you want to. Um, you, uh, you can have as many users on here as you want. Different people can, can collaborate on it. We don't charge extra for C licenses or anything like that. Um, you can save as many scenarios as you want. We don't charge for, you know, buy the scenario or anything. So if you need to have 50 scenarios here in this drop down list, you can save as many as you want and then recall them at will. Um, and when you're ready to share the tool, Internally or externally, you have full control over what and how much of your data that you export. If you're you know, giving a quick quarterly summary to the board, they're not gonna want all those reams of data. They're gonna want a summary analysis. If you're sending it to your auditors, I'm pretty sure they're gonna want the whole kit and caboodle. So you can, you can choose how much data you want to export and send as a PDF, as an Excel file, however you wanna export it. And then also separately here, there's a separate button if you want to do that detailed quarterly data dump, uh, we call it, where it just has every quarterly value going all the way back for your whole portfolio, balances, charge-offs, recoveries, um, so that if you were doing a secondary audit of some of the calculations, you'd have all the data that you need to complete that. Um, we always have extra resources up here. This is a, a great first step if you're confused about something or you haven't looked at it in a while and need a refresher or you bring somebody new onto the team, we've got a user guide here. This is not the user guide. This is the user guide. Um, it's a visual step-by-step -step user guide which walks you through not only how to use the tool, but best practices, what to think about, how to update it on a quarterly basis, a lot of the stuff we've gone through today and more. Um, and so that should be your first, uh, first resource for um, questions. But again, you can always, you know, dial us up, give us an email to, uh, to David. And uh, if you need a one-on-one -on -one consultation, you know, we can get up, we can pull up your scenarios that you're looking at and we can go through it with you and help you where any roadblocks you have. You know, if you're having an audit or an exam and they have questions about it, um, you can always get the people that built the tool online with you when you need help. Um, there's lots of other resources we've got. Uh, in addition to a user guide, a methodology guide, a white paper, an implementation letter. These are two sample, uh, policy template samples. Uh, we've been asked by lots of users if, they, if we could help them write a new policy statement. And while that's typically not in our wheelhouse to be writing policy statements as analysts, we, we got enough uh, questions about it that we sat down, we worked with some early adopters that had 
through exams with Cecil and we worked with multiple different auditing and accounting firms to come up with uh, uh, the, the, the template for the beginning of a, um, a policy template. These are not 100 page Word documents. They're much smaller than that, but they will help you get where you need to be and they're available to, to use. Um, we also have some more detail on explanation for how some of the, the loss calculations are calculated what happened when the NCUA changed their call reports big time last year. Um, an additional Excel-based what we call key factor determination support matrix. That's a, that's a mouthful right there. But it's just an Excel file that kind of provides another framework for more detailed key factor adjustments and narratives. If you want to use it, it's up to you. And then also for due diligence purposes or anything else, if you need um, you know, some uh, information about model validation and whatnot, you'll get that from our SOC report there that we update on an annual basis. Um, public resources, these are just some of the better presentations we've seen done by, you know, by uh, FASB and then uh, other bank regulators and then the NCUA that pertain to CECIL in general, the war methodology specific and its appropriateness and acceptability for the vast majority of typical credit unions. Um, at this point, I think I've touched on everything I wanted to on the on the presentation here, David. So if you want to take back the screen and pull back up the PowerPoint, there's a couple other things we'll go over in there. Sounds good. All right. So I wanted to make sure that um, even though I did a live demo with you guys on the screen, that if you wanted to print out a presentation to share internally, that you'd have some screenshots as well. So the next couple slides we'll go through just quickly. They're just screenshots of summarizing how the tool works and uh, and and how to, how to think about it. So go ahead, go to the next slide. This is just a summary page. It's all the administrative functions. Next slide. The Q factors detail. Next slide. Just reminding you about the new file upload feature. And so peer data. Uh, let's talk about that for one second. People ask sometimes, you know. Who is in my peer group? How do I know who's really being considered there? Can I change my peer group? Um, oh, I just asked a bunch of questions all at once. Um, yes, <laughs> you can change your peer group. Uh, we start by default by using um, your NCUA peer group. And you can specify if you are, you know, NCUA is pretty straightforward, right? They put you in, in peer groups one through six, and it's just by asset size. So if you are, you know, 100 or 50 to $100 million in assets, you are in NCUA peer group four, right? And so we start with that, the NCUA's de definition, and then we allow you geographic specificity. So you can say, I want to look at all the peer group four credit unions in the United States. That's my peer group. Or I just want to look at ones in Wisconsin or just ones in the, you know, the Western region of the country. So you have some flexibility there. Um, if you wanted to see who was in your peer group, or you just wanted to do some analysis on some other credit unions, if you're curious, we have a couple. Uh, so since we figured, you know, since we're aggregating financial data on every credit union in the country now, we can share some of that. So we have a couple of new pages that everyone uh, that can you, everyone who has access to our Cecil Solver also has access to these pages for free, um, just as an added bonus. So you can look at some financial. Um, summary financial data and ratios and performance stuff on any credit union you want in the country. You can look on a quarterly basis, you can change your periods, you can export it and save it, print it off, whatever you want to do with it. Um, we have another tool on the next slide. In addition to just kind of researching individual credit unions, yeah, next slide. Um, we have what we just call a credit union universe at a glance. This allows you to just kind of get a feel for um, some industry trends and uh, and performance ratios across the board. It also, if you are curious as to who's in the NCUA peer group four in Wisconsin, you can uh, drill down and you know sort this by asset size and see exactly who the credit unions are that are in your peer group and see how they're performing and where they're located and everything else. So just some, just some additional data uh, that we thought would be helpful to you guys. So we added into the tool. Um, just a quick note about warm values and prepayment assumptions. I think uh, we did a poll last week, and I think it was about 100 and uh, almost 200 credit unions chimed in on that poll when we asked what were you were most concerned about right now, and whether it was you know being underfunded on your day one adjustment or just you know having the right methodology or what have you. And I believe the results were the number one concern for credit unions were 
am I, are the warm values accurate and acceptable? Because we're getting a feel, we're all getting a feel for how critical, what a big assumption warm calculation is, right? And that makes sense. I mean, Cecil is telling us to estimate losses over the remaining lives. So how we calculate what's the remaining life, pretty important. And some of those assumptions that are in your warm calculations are things like, what am I assuming for prepayments? And that's a rabbit hole that you could go down that you might never get out of because you can go down a very deep, uh, deep rabbit hole in trying to do your own long-term internal, you know, prepayment studies on your portfolio and the data that that takes to do. And even once you've done all that, you're still not at the final point because they're asking you for assumptions about future prepayments, not historical prepayments. So it's, it's challenging to do. And so we, we encourage you to start what we have to offer the, the, the help and guidance and industry uh, uh, data and NCUA guidance specifically about warm values and prepayment assumptions. So that's all in our, in our uh, newer warm estimator tool, I think on the next slide. We just show a screenshot. I already showed you guys this. Um, uh, this is the Excel file, so we can go to the next slide. And yep, that's we already showed that as well. Go to the next slide. And then this is the data that comes from the NCUA that they're going to update each quarter that shows by call report segment how they did warm calc, how they calculated some default industry based, peer based warm calculations and prepayment speeds. Um, there are some limitations to this study that the NCUA contracted out to some somebody to do, but it is much better than nothing, and it's the best that we've got to go on right now. And so we're happy to uh, to talk about that with you. Uh, let's uh, move on. There's additional guidance that we have about prepayments. If you don't want to just rely on the NCUA, the FHFA has some good guidance on prepayment stuff um, for um, for mortgage related loans. And there's some data there and on the next slide too. So go to the next slide. Um, and then one more slide I think we have for other non-mortgage related loans. There's other resources that you can go to that are a little sketchier and a little further out, but still better than nothing. And so we provide that as well. So uh, a heap of, of uh, guidance and direction that uh, we can help out with when it comes to these critical assumptions for, um, for warm and then for CECL. Updating, just a quick thing, updating, you know, so if you're using our tool and you've built your first scenario, you've gone through, you know, thought carefully about each of your key factor adjustments, made notes all throughout the whole thing and saved it. What happens when you come back next quarter? Do we have to, do you have to do that entire process over again from scratch? No, the answer is you don't have to read for each new, well, it's not a parallel run anymore, um, for each new running of your tool, right? You come in, you pull up last quarter scenario, and maybe you update your warm. You know, have you recalculated your warm calculations in the last quarter? Have they are they changing much on a quarterly basis? Do you feel like you need to update them again? Next, roll the historical data to take advantage of the most recent call report stuff that would now be available on the tool. Revisit your Q factors. Check the notes that you've made on your adjustments to see if anything's changed economically or or in your local environment that would suggest you need to tweak your Q factors. Update the loan balances. Now that can be done on an automated basis. And then just check to make sure any assessments haven't been reassessed. So the process of updating an, an old scenario and then saving it as a new one, we don't want to resave. We don't want to save over our old scenarios because then we won't be able to go back in time and see what it looked like six months ago or nine months ago, right? When you save a scenario, the historical integrity remains intact. Everything is frozen in time as of that point. And so you can go back to a scenario you built a year ago and you can compare this year's reserve with last year's and see exactly where it's different. So each time you get new data or you update a scenario at an, as of a new point in time, you want to save it as a new scenario. Um, all right, I think I've beaten that horse as much as I need to. Um, as far as warm support, again, if, if you don't want to do those warms yourselves and you're not getting any assistance from your or whomever and you want us to do it, yes, we'll do that for you. You will provide a secure upload site where you can put that loan level data, and then we'll help you and do those warm calculations side by side with you. Uh, next slide. And that's it, David. You want to take it home? 
Yep. If you uh, at this point, we have almost 400 credit unions. Cecil Solver uh, yep. and help and us, as in the previous slide, Steve mentioned us calculating most of their warms. Um, the data that we need from you is very simple. If on an individual basis, we can obviously cover that. That'll be either myself, David Surrey, or Jason Heinrich to help you. Um, next steps: If you would like to, if you would like a personalized tour, we can certainly do that as well. Just to go over your specific numbers, uh, we can give some guesses on the warms. Um, as far as getting any kind of pricing, it. You know, obviously, a lot of credit unions are curious, how much is this going to cost me? That is based on asset size, so it's going to be different for every single credit union. But again, we can get that to you on an individual basis. We do also have coffee talks that, uh, every single month that Steve and Sean O'Brien, uh, where they're taking questions from our, our credit union community, uh, is one of the best resources we have to just learn a little bit more about Cecil and what's going on uh, within, within that topic. Uh, Steve and Sean just do a fantastic job. We, we've had so much great feedback, Steve. Uh, I haven't been able to share this with you lately, but uh, just fantastic feedback from our credit unions that ha have been attending Excellent. the coffee talks. So kudos to you and Sean for doing such a great job on those. I would highly suggest uh, that you credit unions register for those, whether you use our tool or not. Coffee uh, is not required, but highly <laughs> encouraged. Um, tea, tea is okay, but uh, the high test is, is really preferred. Um, and I'll be drinking mine. And Red Bull for me. There you go, David. Uh, it, <laughs> not a coffee drinker. <laughs> <laughs> not so much. I, I don't see any questions on the Q and A. Um, so, with that being said, we will close out our <laughs> session today. Uh, like I mentioned at the beginning of the call, uh, you will receive an email with this recording and a link to the YouTube page should you want to view this again. But again, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Steve, for all the insight into Cecil today. All of you have sure. a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone.